ever faced pain, I mean real pain, deep pain, defining pain. Well, stay tuned as we look today at Deep Pain with Dr. Mark Talbert, author of When the Stars Disappear. Welcome to Church Hurts and the good, the bad, and the ugly about church, religion, and spirituality with a dash of recovery thrown in. If you've ever had questions about the church, maybe a bit jaded in your attitude toward religion, well, you've come to the right place. Our host, he was an honors philosophy student, ordained a Presbyterian minister, planted three churches, taught at a prestigious university, but now, now he's just an aging curmudgeon who never quits asking the question why. The host of Church Hurts and Dr. John Bash. There was one wooded winding road at the bottom of the hill, right at the midpoint of my 20-minute jaunt to Jim's house. It seemed like a long way in my early teens, traversing the way only teens can do, unabashedly combining quick sprints and slow jogs, periodic skipping, and rarely a normal walking gait. Somehow, this hollow at the bottom of the hill at the end of Merged Stone Road seems special, the terrain prohibiting the constant suburban sprawl for just a few hundred yards as the woods grew wild. By this point in my journey, I was ready for some deep reflection, a safe distance from the place of my fear called home. Few would have guessed the content of the conversation that I permitted myself to speak out loud in this private hollow. Almost always, it was prayer, prayerful questions, reflecting confusion about the pain and fear I lived with on Merdstone Road, one of the least safe places I've ever experienced in life. I asked God to do things on that stretch of road I never would have done in public. Please, God, just lift me up and transport me 10 feet so I can know you really exist. I'd close my eyes as I continued walking, waiting to feel the lift, and then laughing at my own silliness. I knew God didn't play those games, but I thought it would be nice and surely strengthen my faith in the midst of the pain nightmare I called home. Pain comes in lots of forms. We could begin putting adjectives in front of the noun and be here all day, or we could turn it into an adjective and talk about all the painful people, painful experiences, painful churches, painful muscles, painful thoughts. You get the idea. So today, we turn to help for help in an unusual place, a real philosopher of all things. Let's welcome Dr. Mark Talbot to Church Hurts Inn. Good to be here with you, John. Mark, I am, uh, I'm, I usually don't give people's resume, and this isn't a full resume. It's just a sentence from the back of your book, and, and our listeners can't see this, but um, if you watch us on YouTube, you can. But here's a sentence at the back. Mark Talbot. PhD, University of Pennsylvania, teaches philosophy at Wheaton College, working in philosophical theology and philosophical psychology, and on Augustine, Jonathan Edwards, and David Hume. Really, you know, most people have no clue what I just said, and if they do, they wonder if that's just your excuse to walk around perpetually confused. Tell me about that. (laughs) Well, most philosophy courses that students have when they're in college, I think, misfire. But what philosophy is supposed to be is thinking clearly about thinking and then trying to think clearly and well about life's most fundamental issues. And if it's done properly, then, in fact, it's very useful. C.S. Lewis's uh, Oxford degrees were in greats, which, in fact, is a philosophy degree, And that's what accounts for C.S. Lewis's clarity. But as Lewis realized, and as he pretty often said, using philosophical jargon in public is impolite at best. If you can't translate philosophical jargon into ordinary speech, then you don't really understand what you're talking about. Mm. And so it seems to me that that's the step where most philosophers fail. 
Well, let's get real. Let's jump in your life to age 17. You know, um, many people have some specific time in their life when everything changed. I think for you, age 17 would certainly be one of them. Tell me about that. When I was 17, a week after, well, in fact, a couple of days after uh, my junior year in high school, um, I was on a Tarzan-like rope swing that our friend of mine and me had set up in the woods uh, very fast. You had to sit on a seat uh, because you couldn't just hang on with your hands. You started from about 10 feet up in a tree and uh, um, uh, f- flew out over a deep gully. And um, two of us were on it, and a third fellow was going to jump on when we came back the first time to the tree. He waited till the rope hesitated. He jumped then. It meant that the rope was moving away from him. And as a result, uh, he caught me around uh, uh, my neck, and I was hanging on to him. We got out to the far end of the arc. I realized we're going to fall, and if I fall on him, I'll kill him. So I shoved him one way, and myself got peeled off. It was, I think, almost a 50-foot drop, and um, I landed um, with my feet, with my my shoulders, with my feet going over my head and broke my back. Realized it pretty quickly because after I got him settled down, knowing he had to be hurt, it was right at dusk, and I looked and I saw that my legs were in this little creek, and I wasn't feeling anything, and I knew immediately what I had done to myself. Interestingly enough, John, God works different ways with different people, uh, never the same way with any of us. I immediately had a sense of God's love for me. Mm. I had been living an inane life uh, where uh, the things that I was doing were just not important things. They were distractions. I wasn't working hard at school or anything else. When I hit the ground and realized what had happened to me, All of those distractions just fell away. I spent six months in two different hospitals learning to walk again. When I left, I could walk awkwardly with a couple of canes. Um, And I came out with a sense of God's presence. Um, Whenever I would do something such as take a spill, I had a sense of God and his love for me. And so it was a rather remarkable um, juncture or inflection point in my life. So you are in that unenviable class of spinal cord injury victims. Um, give us the labels, since I know the labels. Uh, you're a paraplegic. Right. And what's your spinal column? Uh, you are a T. T10 and 11. T10 Pretty and far 11. down. Um, and I was just struck as you told that story, a weird thing. So we're going to like one of the most painful times in your life a time when you would think the pain would be excruciating and your first response as so many spinal cord victims tell is actually of not feeling. Isn't that weird? It, it seems to me, I had become a Christian when I was 12 and I just was more and more concerned about my life spiraling out of control. I was very bright. Everybody knew that, but I felt I would not even be able to last a year in college because I lacked all sorts of discipline. And um, as a result, I had been, I I had prayed that the Lord would do whatever was necessary to keep me close to him. Now, I do not want to say that I gave him permission for the accident, but, uh, but in fact, my accident actually did that. It, uh, it, It focused me in a way that it has actually focused me ever since, because as you know, with your son, Johnny, uh, any sort of quadriplegia, or paraplegia, is such that you have to deal with things every day that most of the rest of us don't even know are things that might have to be dealt with. Absolutely ridiculous and source of pain for a parent. Um, Uh See, the little things sometimes I just think almost throughout my day are the little things that are no big deal that for you or for Johnny, you know, it's just a pain in the neck uh, to be, okay, we'll, we'll move beyond that really bad one. Um, so now you then go to college because we're picturing 17, 18, the most, like you've just come out of the most self-conscious period in junior high. Now you're starting to kind of get your body, like almost what it's going to be as a full blown adult. And now, as I said, politically incorrectly, when we talked earlier and here you are gimping around on two canes, 
I would have, you know, I wouldn't, I'd look at you and I would have been awkward. I probably would have avoided you, but something else happened that surprised you and surprises me to this day. Talk to me about your first three years of college. Well, I went to college a year and three months after my accident and uh, walked very precariously with either one or two canes. And uh, my walking both looked precarious and uh, looked awkward to observers. So it was obvious that I was struggling every day. This was in Seattle at Seattle Pacific College, and there were hills there. And getting up and down hills when you are paraplegic with canes is really quite difficult. But the fact that I was struggling encouraged other students who were struggling to approach me as somebody who might understand what they were going through. Uh, Probably the best biblical parallel is in 2 Corinthians, the first chapter, where Paul uh, says that he and Timothy had suffered so much that they had despaired of life itself. But then he says, but God, the Father of mercies and Father of all comfort, comforted them in their affliction so that they were enabled to comfort those who were in any affliction with the comfort which they themselves were experiencing by God. That was my experience, too. So here, all these college, and I just think of those college times. The, I mean, the the issues where your body's still kind of range, you're raging with hormones, and you have this little time before you're going to really have to go out of the world. You're just out of the nest and people are finding you a safe place to talk to because already they saw you as kind of a together guy. You kind of liked yourself already, didn't you? Um, I don't know if it was so much liking myself as having this deep sense of God's presence. Mm -hmm. And then there were three uh, people during my college years who were tremendously helpful in helping me to understand myself. The president of Seattle Pacific who came in the year that I was a freshman was David McKenna. Uh, He became uh, a very close friend. Um, Frank Klein came a year later as the dean of religion. The year after that, Cliff McCrath came as the dean of students. Those fellows gave me literally hundreds of hours to understand how I should respond to others who were hurting. And uh, it was just the most remarkable thing. I would sometimes wait outside Frank's inner office Uh, uh, right as he was finishing up his day, he'd get done, he'd come out and he'd see me. He'd say, oh, Mark. He said, give me a second. And he'd go in and he'd call his wife and he'd say, Betty, Mark's here. I'm going to be late for dinner. And it's only as I've been a professor that I realized what a remarkable sacrifice that involved for him never to have said to me, Mark, I don't have time today, but to give me a half an hour or an hour then when we worked through both what I was dealing with and what other people were dealing with. So want to connect how the transition happened from a lot of your time getting taken up by helping other kids in college, uh, connected to your scholarly pursuits. But let me say something first. You work at what I would consider kind of the Ivy League of Christian schools. When you talk about Wheaton, a person doesn't get a job as a philosophy professor at Wheaton easily. And the list of people who would like to get that job is very, very long. Um, Wheaton has an impressive history and philosophy itself, as well as PhD from University of Pennsylvania um, in philosophy. Not bad either, but connect for me. I just say, okay, yeah, you you knew you were smart. I know you're smart from your positions, not even to mention this book is beyond good, by the way. But how did you connect that pain with your scholarly pursuits? What's the connection there? Did you just become an ivory tower egghead? (laughs) Uh, Actually, exactly the opposite. Uh, After a couple of years of my disability, I thought I had learned virtually everything that I needed from it, and I began asking why God didn't just heal me. If God's all-powerful and he's good, he can certainly do it. That led me to confront some of the usual questions that we have about suffering, such as, if God exists, why is there any pain? Why is there this particular pain, whatever the particular pain is? Why is there so much pain? 
Yep. That thinking led me to come up with what is known, and I didn't know at the time that I could figure this out by reading somebody like C.S. Lewis. That led me to come up with what's known as the free will defense uh, for God's goodness and power. And then somebody said to me, you know, Talbot, basically what you're doing is you're doing philosophy and you need to do more of it. I was just uh, gullible and stupid enough uh, in my senior year in college to say, yeah, that's right. And so entered a graduate program. I, I want to take a break uh, just for a second before we uh, dive into some of the uh, deeper insights of your book um, and mention Standing Stone, uh, where I work. But before I do that, Tell me about ChristianScholarsFund.org. And a lot of people don't know about that. And what good work? What's ChristianScholarsFund.org? It's um, a, a group of people who are interested in giving people like me uh, the chance to have our teaching loads lightened um, at the institutions that we're teaching at so that we can think and write more. And Christian Scholars Fund has supported me for about 10 years. Um, uh, I would not be uh, completing this series of four volumes on suffering in the Christian life if it wasn't for them. Uh, it, it has been the time that they've given me. I get one course reduction every term. And um, there's the added bonus that the people who are on the board are willing to read my stuff and tell me when they think it works and connects and when it doesn't. And that's a tremendous uh, gift when one's trying to write for people at all levels of education. Uh, that, that is exciting. I, I just picture the amount of dollars, though, it takes to basically have to replace a whole portion of your salary um, so that you're actually able to spend the time producing the kind of work that that I'm seeing, and I am so thankful for that and for those people who have the resources to do that. And, you know, we happen to know some people together because um, I want to mention Standing Stone, which I work for. Um, at the same time, at, at the privilege or as a, as a privilege because there are those of you who give and allow me to do that. Um, I need to grow my team, and, and ChristianScholarsFund.org needs more supporters too, but I certainly do in this season. Standing Stone, we help clergy and Christian workers um, who, who are hurting, who need encouragement, and a lot of times people don't think that these folks in ministry who are giving all the time, they need help too. And that's what I do, able to come with a few years of uh, experience and and not be surprised by the difficulties people find. So I'd encourage you to go to churchhurtsand.org. At the top, there's a donate button. Just click on that and, and click around while you're there and you see some more shows, um, as well as you can uh, click on the link there to get to see our shows on Facebook, where people can actually see how we're looking at each other through the computer screen as if people want to have more Zoom in their life, right? <laughs> <laughs> I think, John, that what you're doing is crucial to the church. Um, as you and I have talked about separately, uh, it seems to me that all of us as human beings have exposed flanks. Uh, areas in our lives where if a temptation comes to us, uh, our ability to, um, uh, to withstand it um, um, uh, gets stretched to the very limit. And the advantage of having people who have been through difficult things, then having the confidence of pastors and of church leaders in such a way that those pastors and church leaders can come to them and say things that they could never say to their congregation is just central to the church being healthy in the way it's supposed to be. Oh, thank you for saying that, Mark. I, I really, I mean, I, I agree. It's, it's so important. We need to care for those who are caring for others. And at the same time, what's interesting is, as I mentioned, we're, but we both get to do a lot of our work uh, because of generous people. You're asking people like you and me to like ask people if they'd like to be part of that. And that's asking people to do a good thing, but it's not easy, is it? <laughs> no, no. And not uh, our forte. <laughs> yeah, no, no. It's 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 not it's not fun to seem to be putting people on the spot. And actually, um very often I think the best thing is when people actually feel on their hearts that they ought to do something and they volunteer to do it. 
You know, sometimes I, I say to people, you know, when they go onto the forum and it clicks, it goes right to the Standing Stone site. And I said, it's real simple. It's like, you know, how much would you like to give and how would you like to give it? I said, there's a little button called I'd like to give regularly, you know, hit that button. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. <laughs> and reality is, though, what Christian Scholars Fund has done for you has allowed you to plan ahead. That's why I do. I say, do because it's nice to know that there's income coming in four months from now. And right. the fact that you're not going, uh, you know, week to week or month to month. Good for those guys. And right. Um, Profound suffering involves experiencing something so deep and disruptive that it dominates our consciousness and threatens to overwhelm us, often tempting us to lose hope that our lives can ever be good again. If I think of that in the Bible, I go to Jonah. Who goes to you? <laughs> Are you have you heard those words before, by the way? Which words? Oh, oh, yes, they come from the second page of my volume, there where, in go. fact, I have just uh, relayed the story of one of my students who committed suicide by stepping in front of a train. And I'm trying to capture what his parents were feeling and what any of us can feel uh, when uh, things seem to go just horribly awry. I, I just, who else in the Bible, though, when you, when you, I think it's, I mean, it's just so key. I just love the way you put it. It involves experiencing something so deep and disruptive that it dominates our consciousness and threatens to overwhelm us. In so many ways, that's the description of when the stars disappear. I think I love that title, when the stars disappear. Almost everybody can relate to that deep hole of just, and, and it, you know, there's so many different things it could be. I mean, you know, it doesn't have to be, you become a paraplegic. It doesn't have to be that you have a nightmare of a mother. I mean, it, it, it can be all kinds of stuff, but we know when this, you know, in the Bible, we tend to think of these things oftentimes as storybook kind of stories, little tracks. And it's, it's not that when you dig in deep, is it? No. In fact, that's one of the points that I try to make that we, until we suffer deeply, when we read scripture, we tend to kind of read right over the suffering that's in it. And yet, if you think of it, it's just filled with stories of suffering uh, saints of God, both Old and New Testament saints. There's an almost endless supply of stories there. Many of the Psalms, the Psalms of Lament, you've got people like Naomi, uh, who wanted a name change, a permanent name change, because she thought the things were so bad that her life could never be good again. So don't call me pleasant, call me bitter. You've got Job who says, my eye will never again see good. You've got the story of Jeremiah, which doesn't even at the end of it tell us when he died. It just breaks off. And from chapter 21 onward, it actually reads as as. Uh, survival narratives read with those who have been tortured, which is what actually happened to him in chapter 20. And so what Scripture does is it gives us all of those stories, and in most of the cases shows that God rescues his people still in this lifetime, although it it's really quite careful with Jeremiah, with uh, what's told to us in Hebrews 11, Scripture is quite careful to say that God may not with sickness or the sword, but because of who God is, if we remain faithful to him, if we endure, uh, he will meet us, and we will see that all that we've been through, in fact, has involved his loving hand. You know, there is a real sense that we learn from what the Bible doesn't say sometimes. Right. And that's, that's right. what you did with Jeremiah. Yes. You went to what the Bible doesn't didn't say and made a major point, which is really significant. And and in fact, that's where we have to read scripture so carefully. It took me over a year of thinking my way through Jeremiah to be able to say, okay, this is what the Holy Spirit is conveying to us in this book. Uh, and part of our problem is that we are impatient people, not merely Christians, but non-Christians too. We are impatient in such a way that we're not willing to spend the time thinking about things. The way that Mortimer Adler put it in his great book, How to Read a Book, uh, years and years ago, 
was that we, in fact, are supposed to be creatures um, um, uh, who uh, ruminate on our experience and on books. And rumination is, in fact, the thing that happens with a cow when it ends up eating grass and kicking it back up and chewing it again, uh, dry, uh, swallowing it again, bringing it up again. It's rumination. It's thinking about things again and again and again and again that finally shows us the depth of life. Not to do that is to miss uh, what is really important in life and where really the great joys are found. You know, I, you and I refer to the Bible as an important resource. And some of our listeners are like, you know, but, you know, that whole Adam and Eve thing. And they, and they just immediately kind of say, no, nah, I really dismiss it. They're talking about this as an authoritative source. And reality is when you just throw out the Bible, sometimes you have to ask the question and you are left with what? And that brings, that brings, let me try my philosophy out on you here. All right. And here's my view of, of philosophy. Since you're the David Hume guy, you know, you go from Augustine to Jonathan Edwards in that sentence. Okay. The greatest theologian of all time to the greatest theologian of America to David Hume, this um, this man who has the, uh, uh, I don't, I'm, I'm trying to use Christian language here, but this is a man who inspired one of the um, worst influences in philosophy, Immanuel Kant, as far as I'm concerned. Uh, he, so, by the way, Hume claimed on his deathbed that he had not yet completed his greatest work, which was to rid the world of the Christian superstition. Yeah, there, there you go. I mean, <laughs> talk about, okay, so, but anyway, so here you have Immanuel Kant, who um, just basically, here's my summary, is Kant is the watershed of philo philosophical history, where he basically just says, we can't know there's any God, and the Critique of Pure Reason, the hardest book I've ever read in my life, I'm still not convinced that it really makes any sense, but it was effective in the philosophical world of convincing people, we can't know there's a God, um, even if there is one. And he finally completes that, and then he turns around and he turns to ethics and says, well, if ethics can be meaningful, there has to be a God. And you just want to go, really? Thanks, guy. And goes on and does, you know, the great creation of the categorical imperative and all that. Without God, pain really becomes the ultimate pointless. Yes. <laughs> right? Yes. Yes. Um, uh, you can't understand Kant if you don't understand that his parents were Lutheran pietists. And what he wanted to do, what he said in the first critique, and the critique you're talking about, was that he had to deny or limit knowledge, and he meant scientific knowledge, in order to make room for faith. But then faith would not be the same thing as knowledge. And, um, and then what he wanted to claim was that um, ultimately, if there isn't a reward for doing what is right, then life is just meaningless, but that reward can't be found by science. It's got to be found a different way. So more or less what Kant was trying to do was actually preserve the meaningfulness of life of the sort that Christians can understand from Scripture. He was trying to preserve the meaningfulness of life while extracting the Bible. But as I claim in my second volume, ultimately, if you take just a scientific view on the world, you're getting a story fragment. You're not getting enough of the story to be able to understand how life really can be meaningful. And, uh, and to some degree, Kant lost that no, no matter how hard he tried to do otherwise, because he gave up on the Bible as a source. What I would challenge people with, John, is that if they think the scripture is stupid or that it's just a bunch of old wives' tales, they need to read it pretty carefully and realize that it has great insights with regard to suffering, such as Job's comment when he has boils from the top of his head to the bottom of his feet, that he would never again see good, and then realizing that he did see good, all of that in Scripture um, is uh, useful even to those who are not Christians. It tells us how to think about life. A amen. I'm, I'm going to have to leave in just a second. Um, Mark, I knew this would happen. I have like 50 questions I haven't gotten to, but you know, in, in 2016, you had a fall. So now you, even the Canes, you've basically been 
haven't walked since 2016. Tell me an encouraging story because uh, your life is limited in so many ways. Um, You're not crying in your beer, are you? No, something that suffering can teach us is that lots of things can go wrong in life without life itself going wrong. In fact, their going wrong is often a sign that God loves us and he's disciplining us for our good, just as Hebrews chapter 12 says in scripture. Um, uh, uh, A psalmist who evidently was very rich and very well educated in the middle of his psalm says this. This is the psalmist who wrote Psalm 119. He said, before I was afflicted, I went astray, but now I keep your word. You are good and do good. It is good for me that I was afflicted, that I might learn your statutes. The law of your mouth is better to me than thousands of gold and silver pieces. I know, O Lord, that in faithfulness you afflicted me. So what I would give as a story is I went through a time when I felt as if God had set me up and had kind of double-crossed me. And it was such a horrible time that I couldn't sleep more than a few hours a night for several months. Uh, I just couldn't figure out how God in his goodness had allowed what had happened to have happened. But then, in fact, the story with which I open when the stars disappear of my student um, committing suicide by stepping in front of a train, um, uh, those events happened. And I started speaking with his parents. And I realized that what I had been through had prepared me to be able to speak to them in a soft and appropriate way where I didn't brutalize them by giving them set answers, but where instead I could listen to them and understand their pain and allow them to speak it without having to have to correct them and give them a lesson at the end of every session. Mark, thank you so much. Let me just add to that for a second, and then I want to close with a few words. It helps to speak about your own pain, doesn't it? It does. And and that's something people don't get. Like the one thing it's almost you think, no, I don't want to talk anymore about the pain. Let me just go have a couple of drinks and I'll be fine. Let's talk about something else. But actually talking about what you've been through, I, I just um uh, re- brought up an article I'd written four years ago about my father and there's a lot of pain and that's, and it helps talking about it. And, and I'm glad you talked about it with us here today. Thank um, you for having me, John. This has been a show about pain, but has it been really in 1940 CS Lewis wrote a book entitled the problem of pain. It was very influential in my thinking and my youthful Christian days. I found it compelling then, and I find it compelling now, but I don't like the title. I'm not sure pain is as much a problem as it is an opportunity. Rather than compelling us to disbelief, pain has a deep and profound way of spurring us on to contemplation of things getting better. What is that? Where does that come from? As traditional faith of any kind continues to go out of style in our post-Christian era, as raw materialism is somehow accepted as being assumed by intellectuals and scientists, pain brings smelling salts to the dish of life. Ashes to ashes, dust to dust, is that it? Are we really just a random collection of atoms arbitrarily coalescing from the primordial slime? Is it primitive ignorance, which looks above crying out for a god to make sense of all this? Or... Is it a conviction from the deepest parts of our souls which knows better? What does your pain tell you? What does the emptiness you found from your successes tell you? Where do you find hope when loneliness overwhelms and the stars go away? As unbelieving intellectuals have found superiority in their domination of the formal institutes of higher learning, It is interesting that they have left unattended some other positions you might value. When you get that message, that message that what you have is terminal, do you call for the local atheists to come with their words of comfort? Me neither. Quote, God's apparent delay in fulfilling his promises refines our hopes. 
We lift our heads and see God's eschatological rewards from afar as our earthly hopes die. Our suffering inclines us to reorient our hopes towards the consummation. We are sinful, silly, distractible creatures who inevitably major on what is minor if suffering doesn't stop us. Our suffering often needs to be long and hard in order for us to learn the lessons God is teaching. It can be very difficult for us to maintain our faith and hope in the midst of his lessons. Like the Old Testament saints we have studied, our faith may waver and our hope dim. But then we must remind ourselves that our suffering is part of God's refining fire. God uses it to strengthen and purify our faith and hope. What he has begun, he will complete. Page 97, When the Stars Disappear, by Mark Talbot. And it's worth a thought. For Church Hurts and this is John Bash. Go and enjoy God today. Well, that was worth a thought for sure and brings us to the end of this edition of Church Hurts and Next week, it's rumored we'll be walking on the edge of controversy, stirring the pot of denial, and finding movement of the divine. Our host, Dr. John Bash, is a shepherd with Standing Stone, a nonprofit ministry committed to caring for pastors and Christian leaders at risk of leaving the ministry prematurely. Come visit us at churchhurtsand.org. Tell us your story while you're there. Until then, remember, Church Hurts isn't the end of the story. Now go into the end. Enjoy God today, won't you?